to all those who devoted their lives to aviation. The Wings of Russia Studio presents Wings of Russia Documentary April 26, 1986 Two explosions burst out at the fourth energy block of the Chernobyl atomic power station. It was a catastrophe. Scientists proposed to seal the atomic reactor with a protective sand layer. But there was no other way to approach the crashed facility than by air. Such task could be carried out only by helicopter. One after another machines flew toward the energy block to drop sand over the target. Helicopters had to hover right over the epicenter. Temperature was reaching 200 degrees Celsius. Radiation thousand times exceeded all possible norms. Under such dramatic circumstances, helicopters and pilots showed their best. Helicopters. Workers and soldiers. By mid-50s, there were two well-established helicopter design bureaus in the USSR. One was headed by Mikhail Mil, who favored single-rotor machines. The other bureau was headed by Nikolai Kamov, designing coaxial rotor helicopters. Both bureaus obtained fundamental experience in resolving problems of either layout. Quite capable helicopter units were already developed. Transmissions, gearboxes, blades. A new power plant was required for the transition to a new qualitative level. Since the appearance of the gas turbine engines, the idea of putting them on helicopters never left designers' mind. Of course, such engines had deficiencies, but they were insufficient as compared to advantages. The gas turbine engine was easy in maintenance and could be turned on even at low temperature. Moreover, the weight-to-power ratio was attractive. Piston engines did not allow to make a helicopter larger. Now this limitation was gone. The first Soviet helicopter with the gas turbine engine was the huge MI6. This mass-produced rotary wing machine served as a new means for the relocation of troops and combat equipment and responded to the main military task of those years, units quick escape from a nuclear attack. The MI6 cargo cabin allowed to transport the same cargo volumes as the AN-12 transport aircraft could. The main achievement of the Mill Design Bureau was creation of a rotor system of such an enormous machine. The worldwide experience at that time was against building helicopters of such size and payload. Its five-blade rotor had 35 meters in diameter. A unique gearbox was needed to transmit power from the engine to such a big rotor. Mill found an elegant solution of this complicated problem. He also found an optimum layout of the entire power plant from the point of view of center of gravity. Two engines were placed in the upper part of the fuselage. Such layout became classical for all helicopters with gas turbine engines. This machine first took off in summer 1957. It was piloted by test pilot Rafael Caprillan. The MI6 payload was 12 tons, seven times more than of his piston engine predecessor MI4.
Surprisingly enough, MI6 had not only the highest payload capacity, but it was the fastest helicopter in the world. Thanks to the wing it was equipped with, MI6 reached speed of 340 km per hour. For the development of such a unique machine, the American Helicopter Association awarded Mikhail Mil the Sikorsky Prize. MI6 found its multiple application, transportation of missiles to the launching sites, relocation of troops and combat equipment. This helicopter was widely used in search of the landing spaceships. It was issued as a mobile refueling vessel, an airborne command unit and a fire extinguishing helicopter. At numerous construction sites, this helicopter was used as a flying crane. But the most significant among civil applications was MI6's contribution to the exploration of the oil and gas fields in Siberia and the northern impassable areas. Especially for the relocations by helicopter, drill sites were disassembled into blocks of up to 8 tons each. Helicopters moved tubes and houses. Oil production was so important for the state that up to 50 MI6 worked in the two main region alone. A helicopter of the same class was developed in the Kamov Design Bureau as well. It was called KA-22. Before that, the Kamovs designed only coaxial rotor helicopters. However, this time the general task did not allow to use such a layout. The helicopter was based upon a combined layout and was called the rotary wing. It had two rotors and two pullers. The propeller control unit provided for the smooth power transfer from the pullers to the rotors and back. The idea was simple to combine advantages of an aircraft and a helicopter in a single layout. However, the Kamov's aim to combine advantages of an aircraft and a helicopter did not prove true. It was more a combination of multiplied deficiency. The machine parameters could hardly be calculated. The Kamovs made an experiment, but it did not clear the situation either. Development of the rotor wing machine was started simultaneously with MI6, however KA-22 performed its first flight two years later. Its cargo cabin was not much bigger than that of MI6 and it was not much faster. There were a lot of problems, most of which could not be resolved at the technical level of that time. In spite of all this, KA-22 was put in production. The process was long and it was terminated by a number of catastrophes. Army demand for heavy helicopters was covered by MI6. Its successful utilization in the relocation of suspended large-size cargoes brought to an idea of developing a specialized helicopter. In 1958, the Mill Design Bureau offered an optimized layout of MI6. The voluminous fuselage was made more compact and the lesser weight allowed to increase the payload. That's how the MI-10 crane helicopter appeared. The Army was of course its first customer. The plan was to have special cargoes, the nuclear charges suspended on the helicopter. Civil application of this helicopter was no less advantageous, especially in bringing cargoes to difficult-to-access areas. The helicopter was proudly demonstrated at national parades and foreign exhibitions. In 1965, MI-10 and other Soviet helicopters were getting to the exhibition in France all by themselves. They had to cross six European countries and everywhere Soviet helicopters attracted a lot of public attention. In September 1966, an MI-10 modification, MI-10K, made its first flight. This machine managed to get rid of excessive weight dictated by its initial military application. 
Gear legs became shorter. All glass cockpit of the pilot operator appeared under the fuselage, allowing to control the helicopter during construction and installation works. Although the helicopter had a significant deficiency, high vibration at low speed. Such was a typical working speed for MI-10, and this peculiarity accompanied the helicopter throughout its entire life. But even in spite of such a deficiency, economic effect of MI-10 was impressive. Operations were done several times faster and cheaper. Moreover, there were works that could be done only with the help of MI-10. For example, putting electric line supports in place or construction of TV towers. MI-10 unique capabilities were required in the 21st century as well, when skyscrapers, one after another, started to grow in Moscow. George Washington, the first nuclear submarine, was commissioned in the USA in February 1959. It could carry 16 ballistic missiles. The main task for the Soviet Navy was not to lose sight of the menacing enemy. Its submarines were fast and quiet. But the need was in a hunter with a sensitive ear, sharp sight, and a powerful destructive capability. A deck-based helicopter could perform the role of such a vengeful harpoon. The Kamovsko axle rotor helicopters, indifferent to side winds, were most suitable for deck basing. Nikolai Kamov developed his KA-25 anti-submarine helicopter with the total support of the Navy Supreme Commander, Sergei Gorshkov. This machine performed its first flight in spring 1961. In summer of the same year, it was shown at the Tushina Air Parade. Helicopter carried impressive-looking missiles, however, they failed to frighten the potential enemy. The dummy missiles could be well identified with unaided eyes. K-825 was commissioned in the end of the 60s to join long-term naval cruises. KA-25 was made in two simultaneous versions, an anti-submarine helicopter detecting and destroying submarines and a target designation helicopter, a kind of a cruiser eye watching within a range of 250 kilometers. For its time, the helicopter had an impressive equipment, a radar, sono bios, self-homing torpedoes and D-bombs. Лёт группы разрешаю. The coaxial helicopter's ability for stable hovering was used in the KA-25 crane version development. It was of course in a different weight category than MI-10K, but for certain minor works it was even more suitable. However, this modification of KA-25 was not put into serial production. Once Kamov and Mill standing together were asked one and the same question, which layout is better? Single rotor, replied Mill. No, mine is better, replied Kamov. Indeed, only Kamov managed to bring the rare and very complicated coaxial layout to perfection in his ship-based KA-25.
At the turn of the 50s and 60s, armament was growing bigger and heavier, requiring larger helicopters with greater payload. However, mill designers were also thinking of less massive projects, for example, substitution of the outdated piston engine MI4. It was rather difficult to acquire funding for such minor matters. As it was many times in the Russian history, Mill gained his ends by arts, acquiring funds not for a new helicopter, but for the MI4 modification. Nobody thought that in result there would appear the most popular and world-famous MI-8. Here is how it all happened. Starting MI-4 modification, designers soon discovered that nothing was left of the helicopter's basic outlook. Fuselage became more capacious. Instead of the piston engine, there now was a gas turbine engine. However, the number one customer, as the army was called, still paid no attention to the new machine while civil organizations, on the contrary, got interested a lot. The test sample was called V-8. In June 1961, the helicopter made its first flight and two weeks thereafter, it was demonstrated at the Tushina Air Parade. A life-changing event in the history of this helicopter came in summer 1962, when V-8 was equipped with two new engines. They were called TV-2117 and were developed in the Young Design Bureau of Sergei Izotov. And while before that helicopters were equipped with adapted aircraft engines, TV-2117 was initially made as an engine for helicopter. MI-8 success partially belonged to the engine. Such helicopter turned out to be three times more productive than MI-4. That's when the real interest to MI-8 appeared. It was put into production in several versions at the time. Its popularity, both with the army and civil organizations, grew like an avalanche. And not only inside the country, abroad customers lined up for the helicopter. The initial MI-8 layout turned out so successful that dozens of modifications were made on its bases. But the most significant step in the helicopter's modernization was about to come. Simultaneously with MI-8, the Mill Design Bureau worked on the development of a super-heavy machine as the Army demanded. After MI-6, abilities for any further payload increase were deemed far from being exhausted. Works on developing a new helicopter capable of lifting 25 tons, twice as much as MI-6 could, started in 1962. Mill convinced the customer that it was possible to develop a helicopter with a cargo cabin similar in volume with the cabin of the AN-22 transport aircraft. A cartoon film clearly showed capabilities of the new machine. It was V-12. It had an important task to relocate strategic missiles, withdrawing them from the enemy's attacks. The calculated takeoff weight required installation of four engines. There was no way putting them in a single rotor layout, so a side-by-side -side rotor layout was chosen. Propeller group engines were placed in the end of the wings. Each of them represented an analog of the MI6 rotor system. In summer 1967, the crew headed by test pilot Vasily Kalashenko took this gigantic helicopter into the sky. Tests went surprisingly smooth. The machine showed high controllability, low noise and minor vibration level. Its maximum takeoff weight amounted to 105 tons. Helicopter could carry 36 types of heavy combat equipment. The cargo cabin could accommodate up to 200 soldiers. V-12 set several world records, in particular lifting 40 tons of cargo to an altitude of 2 kilometers. V-12 became a star at the Le Bourget Air Exhibition in 1971. 
Everything went on fine. A special factory was being prepared for the V-12 production. But in January 1970, Mikhail Mil died, and the customer turned its order for the helicopter down. The design bureau was headed by Marat Tishenko. It was important for him to prove that the Mill Design Bureau was still a strong team. A significant and efficient project was required. MI-26 became the one. Its payload was somewhere between MI-6 and V-12. The main idea of the helicopter was its high lifting capacity. It was supposed to carry as much as its own weight. The design bureau struggled against excessive weight of systems and units. In result, the machine layout was made at the limit of durability. Fiberglass was used for the blades in order to lower the weight and increase the resource. The titanium main rotor head also became lighter. However, the rotor system weight reduction aggravated the outer rotation when the helicopter had to descend with the shut-off engines by using energy of the winding rotor. The first liftoff took place in December 1977. MI-26 was piloted by the crew of test pilot Gurgen Karapitan. Further test flights showed correctness of calculations. The helicopter had impressive capabilities of transporting heavy and bulky cargoes. The machine was of high demand. It started to arrive in the combat units in the end of the 80s. Civil aviation obtained MI-26 as well. This helicopter performed well at transporting very heavy cargoes with the help of external load sling system. MI-26 proved itself a reliable and often indispensable machine in fighting fires and natural calamities. In 1986, a catastrophe occurred at the Chernobyl nuclear power station. MI-6, MI-8 and MI-26 helicopters were involved in the emergency operation. Actions had to be performed in close vicinity to the damaged reactor in the area of high radiation. In order to dampen the heart of the reactor, thousands of tons of special liquids and other materials were thrown down on it. Such work could not be performed without the selflessness of the helicopter's crews who knew very well of the consequences they will bear. Together with gigantic machines, the Mill Design Bureau continued to pay attention to minor helicopters. In order to substitute MI-1, a new helicopter of the same class but with bigger transportation capacity was required. The machine was called MI-2. Airflot was the interested party in the first place. It needed a helicopter for agricultural works. On the other hand, the Army wanted to have a small machine in the transport liaison, ambulance and training versions. MI-2 was twice heavier than MI-1, but it could lift three times more. It was a universal machine with all the advantages and defaults. MI-2 was interesting to many customers. National factories were busy with producing other helicopters at that time, therefore this machine was assigned for production in Poland. It already had some experience. MI-1 was produced in the city of Svidnik. Now it received a new order for MI-2. Until 1998, the Poles produced almost 5.5 thousand helicopters, which were supplied to dozens of different countries. However, most of MI-2 worked in the Soviet Union. This helicopter was supplied to air clubs, military aviation schools, and air units of civil aviation. Soviet and Polish sportsmen performed at championships on MI-2. This helicopter was also on board the Arctica Icebreaker, which in August 1977 reached the North Pole. This machine was easy at keeping the course. 
MI-2 was steady and easy in control. An excellent machine. In the film Mimino, the hero of Bakhtan Kikabidze flew MI-2 helicopter. The other light helicopter of the same class, KA-26, was designed by the Comov Design Bureau. Deputy head designer Mark Kupfer was responsible for it secretly from Comov himself. The layout had no extras. While MI-2 was somewhat heavy, KA-26, on the contrary, was lighter. Only those points were reinforced that required such reinforcement. K-26 had an interesting layout, the so-called flying landing gear, with different easy replaceable modules, a passenger cabin, a cargo platform, a hook to suspend cargoes, geological equipment, and a bunker for chemicals. Simplicity in the layout made this machine easy to maintain, a quality rather valuable for national conditions. It had piston engines which were less consuming than the gas turbine engine. In general, the helicopter was cheaper and practical. This made this helicopter the most efficient among the Soviet rotary wing machines of that time. Among many professions mastered by this helicopter, the main was agriculture. It was in this sphere that the capabilities of this helicopter were most noticeable. It became a reliable assistant to agro-technologists in the struggle against illnesses and pests. This helicopter could sprinkle up to 600 hectares of wine yards with a high agrotechnical effect and could substitute up to 45 sprinkler tractors on such works. In 1966, KA-26 was awarded a gold medal at an international exhibition of agricultural equipment. The machine was the first Soviet helicopter certified under the American Flight Qualification. A total of 850 such helicopters were built, of which 150 were sold around the world. Achievements in helicopter construction were demonstrated not only at international exhibitions, at rendezvous of the Soviet and American Navy ships in the Mediterranean Sea, they could not help but exchanging helicopter curtsy. There you are, a Sea Sprite anti-submarine helicopter takes off from an aircraft carrier. In response, KA-25 submarine Hunter starts off from the deck of the aircraft carrying cruiser to perform a demo flight. KA-25 was good at discovering submarines, but the potential enemy developed new submarines with greater diving and lesser noise level. A qualitatively new helicopter equipment was required to hunt and destroy them and helicopters were supposed to cover a wider patrol area. In 1970, the Comov Design Bureau received an order for a new anti-submarine helicopter. Since it was supposed to be deck-based, its dimensions had to be no bigger than those of its predecessor. This machine became the last for Nikolai Kamov. After his death, the bureau was headed by Sergei Mikheyev. Under his supervision, works on KA-27 continued. The team fulfilled the task. 
This helicopter was commissioned in 1979. Ship based in groups and as a single unit, these helicopters are still in service. KA-27 take part in long-range crusades with real search and tracking of potential enemy submarines. The Kamov helicopters could do their job from ship decks in any part of the ocean. However, for the coast area protection, another helicopter was required. It was supposed to be land-based. The successful Mi-8 was taken as a prototype. The bottom of the fuselage was turned into a boat. However, TV-2117 engines did not provide enough power-to-weight ratio. Situation changed only in 1965 when the Zotov's Design Bureau offered a new, more powerful TV-3117 engine. Now the helicopter combined both the detecting and striking functions. It was identified as Mi-14. Fuel reserve allowed this machine to barrage for three hours. For water landing, the landing gear was made retractable. Water landing allowed to perform detection longer than at hovering. There was a bomb room in the fuselage bottom. To fight submarines, helicopter carried bombs and torpedoes. Its principal difference was that it could carry a one kiloton scalp miner nuclear bomb. Helicopter had three main modifications, anti-submarine, minesweeper, and rescue. Amphibious qualities of Mi-14 make it suitable for the use for peaceful purposes, in particular as an efficient sea rescue facility. With the help of an external hoist and various other equipment, victims could be fished out of water and taken on board. Pilots liked this machine, calling it the liner. And it did comply with such definition. It had minor vibration, long flight, and impressive dimensions. Technicians, on the contrary, had to clean and dry the helicopter after each flight to avoid corrosion. The new Izotov's engine serving well on Mi-14 suited Mi-8 perfectly. It was a lucky chance to improve capabilities of the latter. Just like Mi-8 once shared its fuselage and the rotor system with Mi-14, now the latter passed its power plant to Mi-8. The helicopter obtained a new life. Its modification was called Mi-8MT. Abroad, it had an export identification as Mi-17. Commercially successful machine attracted even more attention. In the beginning of the 60s, the Mill Design Bureau came up with an idea of a transport combat helicopter, an airborne analog of the infantry combat vehicle. It was needed for the assault forces landing and troops fire support. Correctness of such an approach was proved by the combat activities in Vietnam. There, Americans were successfully using helicopters, although assault forces landing and troops fire support were performed by different types of helicopters. The first task was carried out by Iroquois, while the second by Hugh Cobra. The Mill Design Bureau decided to combine both tasks in one machine. The Mi-8 rotor system and most of its units were used for the new helicopter. It was called Mi-24. The pilot and operator gunner were put inside an armored cockpit. In the first version, it was united. But this made both pilots vulnerable at the same time. Visibility from such a cockpit was not at all the best one. 
In 1971, the cockpits were separated. Well protected, they were placed one after another at different levels for better visibility. The cargo cabin allowed to carry eight soldiers. For striking operations, MI-24 was equipped with a four-barrel machine gun. It also carried guided and non-guided missiles suspended on pylon. The other version with two fixed 30mm cannons was no less menacing. A limited edition of MI-24 was issued with a flexible cannon. MI-24 received its fire season in Afghanistan. That war could be called a helicopter war. With no roads and lots of mountains, helicopters soon turned from support into the main and indispensable force. Assault troops landing and their fire support, performance of strikes, ground vehicles escorting, and airdromes protection, you just name it. All described above totally refers to the mill MI-8. A combat group would, as a rule, consist of two MI-8 and two MI-24. New tactics was mastered. Interaction of the two machines in Afghanistan was brought to perfection. Choppers carried the main burden of the war. By 1988, there were over 300 helicopters fighting in Afghanistan, performing five to six flights per day. So many lives were saved. For many, a dear chopper was their last hope. They were coming to rescue under the enemy's fire, sometimes beyond any flight norms and limits. Helicopters were returning from a fight heavily riddled, having little time to spend on repair. Those machines showed how viable, enduring, and unpretentious they were. Nineteen eighties were difficult times for the Soviet Union. The country facing a crisis had no time to develop new aircraft equipment. Projects that fell on those years experienced a lot of difficulties. A whole number of helicopters was made on the basis of MI-27. The KA-29 assault transportation helicopter was designed for the relocation of Marines. The armored cabin can carry up to 16 Marines. Various armament for the assault troops fire support could be suspended on pylons. One of KA-27 modifications was KA-31, the radar watch helicopter. Its task was to search for the sea surface and airborne targets. The KA-32 Sybil version was used for transporting cargo. It has a fire extinguishing version. In mid-80s, MI-2 flying for clubs was substituted by a light training MI-34. Its layout can bear triple G loads and could perform aerobatics not typical for helicopters. The need to substitute MI-2 resulted in the appearance of another helicopter, V-3, which was designed by the Polish and Soviet experts. 
V-3 was supposed to become a mass helicopter, however, political events in Poland crossed out such plans. The Svidnik factory built only around 150 machines. The 90s brought new life to the light Ka-26. Instead of the piston engine, this helicopter was first equipped with one and later another gas turbine engine and was turned into a new Ka-226 helicopter. But still the most serious competition went on among combat helicopters. It started in the 80s and still continue today. The two competitors are MI-28 and KA-50, which took off in summer 1982. Development of those machines was assigned by one and the same resolution of the government. The entire Mills experience of the combat helicopter's utilization stood behind MI-28. The Kamov's traditionally servicing the Navy took up the ground topic for the first time. The Air Force did not put any specific assignment and designers of both teams started to develop their combat helicopters based upon their own way of thinking. The two concepts were almost the same, a flexible platform for various types of armament. By that time, automatics and electronics reached a certain level of perfection, and the Kamovs thought that a pilot would handle both piloting and gunning all by himself. Ka-50 was made single-seated. The Mills were closer to a more viable concept accepted around the world, a two-seated helicopter with separate functions of the pilot and the gunner. Both helicopters obtained protection of the cockpit and the most important units. Engines on both machines were located on the sides for the sake of viability. For the first time in the world, Ka-50 was equipped with emergency escape system including a catapult and blades blow-off function. Mi-28 was equipped with no less interesting crew survival system, a special gearbox absorbing the shock at emergency landing. Armament of both helicopters was practically identical. A flexible 30mm cannon, guided and non-guided missiles, including air-to-air -air class. Each party tried to prove advantages of its machine. But the political situation in the country changed and funding was reduced. Nevertheless, competition continued. One party after another made statements from time to time that it was their helicopter that was decided to be produced and that funds would be allocated any time. In the 90s, with the air shows taking place in Zhukovsky, each company started to appeal to public, offering it to be the judge. Helicopters painted aerobatic figures as the roll and the loop. For the sake of advertising, the Kamovs named its helicopter the Black Shark. This did not bring the machine any new capabilities, but it added public attention. The peak of the helicopter's promotion was a feature film made in the beginning of the 90s with a black shark starring. This is your day. This moment was supposed to happen. You are born to fight. Well, dear, feeling sad, me too. Everyone feels the same when leaving home. You're growing up. This is your first task. I know you will succeed. You can do a lot better than the others. 
All the best to you. In order to expand KA-50 combat capabilities, a two-seated KA-52 alligator was built in mid-90s. This helicopter is planned to be used as an airborne command post of a helicopter combat unit. The Comov Design Bureau issued another new helicopter, the multipurpose KA-60. Designers stepped off their traditional coaxial layout, making a fenestron-type tail rotor. The Mill Design Bureau performed modernization of their MI-28. Works in the first place were aimed at providing for the helicopter's 24-hour application. The version was called MI-28N. The successful MI-24 also obtained new combat capability. It was modernized for the purpose of the nighttime application. This was achieved through the use of the onboard radio electronic equipment with night goggle. Armament assortment expanded. To improve flight characteristics, the later version was equipped with the MI-28 rover system peculiar for an X-type tail rotor and GRP blade. MI-24 was and has been imported to more than 20 countries of the world. It took part in 40 military conflicts. Among other machines, this helicopter could be called the most militant. MI-24 is the main helicopter used in the army aviation of modern Russia. In 1992, in the city of Tarzok, where the helicopter center is located, the Golden Eagles Aerobatic Group was organized. It performs on the MI-24 combat helicopters. Pilots perform aerobatics in various cities of Russia and abroad. MI-8 continues its successful flight career. Its new military and civil variants appear. MI-8 is now the most popular helicopter in the world. In the history of the world helicopter construction, MI-8 has no match in its class. Its total production has amounted to 12,000 machines. There is probably no country where this helicopter did not operate. In terms of popularity and reliability, MI-8 can be compared with Kalashnikov. Before 1995, there were only two helicopter design bureaus in this country, Kamovs and Mill. Since 1995, the Kazan Helicopter Factory's design bureau has been certified. It used to draw attention before, when it was a branch of the Mill Design Bureau. First stages of the new MI-38 development took place at that factory. It was seen as a deep modernization of MI-8, twice surpassing its predecessor in productivity. MI-38 performed its first flight in December 2003. After becoming independent, the Kazan Design Bureau, despite many difficulties, has built several helicopters of its own. A multipurpose ANSAT. A reconnaissance ANSAT 2R Tsek. There has been almost no country left in the world that could do without helicopters. The forecast shows stable growth in the demand for such air equipment.
On the other hand, not everyone can offer a whirly machine. The Russian helicopter industry with its half a century experience is so far among the leaders. Keeping this position in the competition requires continuous efforts.